Okay. Please remind me to turn off at the end of the class period. Last time I forgot, and it like recorded like part of the next class that came in here, Mr. Blevins' class. That was kind of weird. So anyway, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Have a touch of please. All quiet, please. Thank you. So go ahead, have your notes out. We're going to continue wrapping up with the Vietnam War. And we may get into the next um, issue, which is mutual assured destruction. Um, we actually won't completely finish out the Vietnam War because we're kind of following the organizational structure that they have in the uh, CNN Cold War movie series. Okay? You okay? All right. We're in, we're in history now. All right, so settle in. There we go. Okay? Um, so... There we go. You got your chapter 39 quiz information. That'll be on the Thursday when you guys get back. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because today was the last day to get that done. Are we actually going to see Jack and uh, Jacob here today? Jack is what? Oh, he's leaving. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, so, you know, we're survivors. We're going to continue, right? The people at home can watch at home. The people are here, are here for the live telecast. Um. <laughs> We're not to our break yet. We'll be in our break soon enough. And it will be awesome. Yes. Okay. Questions? Are you ready? You got your like you guys are taking notes? That's fascinating. You can take much notes much better like than on a like a keyboard. You can type faster on that with the thumbs. It's amazing. I, mean, I actually took a class when I was in junior high school about how to type on a a, a, a typewriter. I got a class on that. I got a junior high school credit. <laughs> Not that that amounted for much, but nevertheless, I learned how to type. But I'm still a hunt and peck kind of thing. And I'm not too bad on a little device, although sometimes the fingers, I don't know. It's a little hard. So here we go. You ready, Daniel? Should we go to it? Yeah. America in the Vietnam War. Yeah. Who are the people who are causing us, the United States, and the South Vietnamese such difficulty the North Vietnamese, and who is the North Vietnamese supported by, Ellie? Okay, he's the leader. Uh, what countries support uh, North Vietnam? Soviet Union is their best friend. You got that right down? The best friend of North Vietnam is the Soviet Union, but they also have another pretty darn good friend just to the north that's also communist. Very good, China. Very good, communist China. Okay? So, although we'll see later on as things develop, the Soviet Union and Communist China are going to have some tension between them. It's going to be a little bit of an issue, and so we'll just try and like, take advantage of that. And in fact, that will come out here. In fact, here's the weird thing. Check this, right? You can see some, of, write this down. You can see some of the tension developing because literally, Soviet Union's right up here, right, on the map, what is now Russia, and China's just to the south, and China is on the northern border of Vietnam. So if you wanted to, if you're the Soviet Union, and they did this a little bit, they would send some of the supplies to Vietnam, North Vietnam, through China. Write that down. They would send some of them through China, but then they discovered maybe they shouldn't send too many of them through communist China, because not all of them were arriving at the destination. Communist China was sometimes like taking some of those supplies for itself. So if the Soviet Union wants to make sure that all the supplies that it intends to go to North Vietnam actually get to North Vietnam, what do they have to do? Take it themselves and deliver it, a lot of them by ship, to North Vietnam. And of course, does the United States know that there are Soviet ships that are delivering all kinds of weapons? Yes, we do. Tara, what can the United States do to prevent Soviet weapons from being handed over to the North Vietnamese and used by the North Vietnamese regular army and the Viet Cong against our troops and against the South Vietnamese. What could we do? 
well, we're not going to protect ourselves. How about this? I'm a commander. You're the president, all right? So you're Johnson. You're President Johnson. And I'm saying, there's all these Soviet ships. They're full of weapons. Those weapons are going into the hands of people that are killing our boys over there. Shouldn't we just, like, blow up those ships? What do you mean it's not a good idea? We could. Why wouldn't it be a good idea? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You're the president of the United States. Talk to your, talk to your defense secretary, Daniel. You're going to be the defense secretary. Chew and swallow, okay? You're the defense secretary. At this point in time, let me see. Who would the defense secretary be? McNamara. Okay, McNamara. What advice do you give to the president as to, like, whether or not? I mean, I'm giving you technical, practical advice. The United States military could blow up those ships before they unloaded all those weapons that would be used against United States servicemen. A blockade? I mean, but why, why bother with a blockade? Because they might get through the blockade. Why don't we just, like, identify with the ships and just blow them up? Can we bully them? <laughs> Threaten them with what? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Do they have anything on their side that they can threaten us with? Do you have some advice, too? Yes. What's your advice? Yes. He was the top general for the United States military over in the Vietnam conflict. So, Tara, if the United... Well, I'll answer the question in part. Because you're right. President Johnson is not going to have U.S. military forces directly hit Soviet ships that are delivering weapons. Because if we directly hit a Soviet ship, what might the Soviets do? Oh, they're just going to get mad, and they're going to, like, send a really angry telegram to the president. I'm sorry, what? With what? What kind of weapons did the Soviets have plenty of by this time? Exactly right. So here's the thing. And you'll hear, I mean, if you actually heard the voice of Lyndon Baines Johnson at this time, he would, and there are some recordings of him. He's just like, I don't want to make World War III. Write it down. He does not want World War III. This is why we talked a little bit about how the United States is, is in a sense, fighting a war with his hand tied behind his back. We're, we're not hitting Soviet reinforcements, Soviet supplies coming in to North Vietnam. I mean, are the North Vietnamese able to create all those military supplies themselves? I don't think so. A lot of them they get from the Soviet Union and some from the uh, People's Republic of China. So we don't want to have World War III. Yes? Some of them they sent through China, but they discovered if they send it through China, it doesn't always get there. Uh, okay. Or it doesn't get there as a complete package. Okay. Right? I mean, if like, can you imagine somebody in your family, if you're like, uh, can you deliver this to mom? Let's say it's a fresh baked pie or something like that. Would that get there? <laughs> Stern's like, well, I can do that one. Sure, I'll deliver it, but there's going to be a user fee. I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, you're going to take something off the top. Uh, next question, all right? Let's say that, uh, say, you're General Westmoreland. I got a question for you. Why don't you advise the president to just, like, the heck with fighting them in South Vietnam. Take the fight directly to North Vietnam, for goodness sakes. It's like the Korean War. North Korea attacked South Korea, and our forces pushed them all the way back up into North Korea. Why don't we just, like, attack North Vietnam? Land our, land our soldiers on the beaches of North Vietnam and attack them. Are you, can, are you afraid that something's going like to something's gonna go bad? Let's remind ourselves. Let's remind ourselves. Raise your hand if you can tell me. What happened in the Korean War when United States General MacArthur pushed the North Korean troops out of South Korea and out of North Korea, and we're like going all the way up to the Chinese border? Then what happened? The Chinese got involved directly, yes. And so there's a fear, write this down. There's a fear that if we took the fight into North Vietnam. We actually like engaged in fighting in North Vietnam. Yeah, we'll bomb them, and we do plenty of that. But if we landed soldiers and took the fight into North Vietnam, then maybe the Chinese would jump in 
and they would send their military directly involved there. Or the Soviets, but definitely the Chinese. They've been willing to do that 10 years previous. Would they be willing to do that again? Sure. Again, it's this whole thing of let's not fight a war that could expand into something else. But the downside is, of that is you get critics saying, if we're not going to fight this war to win it, what are we fighting this war for? The longer this war goes on and there's not a clear outcome, is that good for the United States of America or for South Vietnam, for that matter? Write this down. You ready? This is a problem politically for the United States, and ultimately that's going to be the main thing that's going to cause the Vietnam War to be over. President Johnson sends in more troops. It's like with just a few more troops, maybe 100,000 more, 100, maybe a little bit of 100,000 more, we can, get, we can get the job done. And put this down, put this expression down, the light at the end of the tunnel. You hear this a lot from like military advisors, even from like say President Johnson. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, which is an interesting reference. When is a light at the end of the tunnel like something that would be a good thing for you? When you're trying to get out of the tunnel, like I mean, if you guys ever get like a little bit claustrophobic when you're like going into a tunnel or so forth, because you're like, I don't know. I mean, you don't really do that so much here. We don't have too many tunnels around here, but. Yeah, so like you're in the tunnel and you're like, oh, there's the light. And then you keep moving toward the light and it gets bigger and bigger and then you're out of the tunnel and you don't have to worry about thing, anything collapsing on top of you. So the goal, the idea behind that is the United States military is saying, we're going to win this. Write it down. You hear that in 65, 66, 67, 68. The United States is like, we're going to win this. We're going to win this. And our military is, write this down. We win a lot of fights. We go into combat, you know, with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese and we like, you know... We kill lots of the enemy. Of course, some of those body count <coughs> things are a little bit impervious because sometimes um, what we'll hear is, you know, if they're Vietnamese and they're dead, it's the enemy. And do you have to be uniformed in order to be a Vietnamese enemy? No, of course, because a lot of the fighters are guerrilla. Do you have to be a male necessarily to be the enemy? No. And so some of those body count figures that are given to the American public and so forth to say we're winning this thing aren't necessarily a clear indication that we're winning this thing. Because the thing is, you could go in, take over, defeat an enemy, and then they're gone, and then you pull the U.S. troops back out, you know, because you don't want to leave them there, and then the next day, the enemy's right back there again. Write this down. A lot of the ways we actually do our fighting is through helicopter. You're going to see that in the film. We fly our helicopters in, we land, we shoot them up, we shoot them up, we take out the enemy. The enemy is either killed, defeated, or they go scurrying off. And then we pull out again. Or if we keep a permanent base, then it could get really sticky. Because if we got a permanent base, then we could come under fire. I know that. I talked to my dad. My dad, Congressman Orwell Hanson. Uh, he wanted to know about Idaho servicemen. They were in the reserve units. Or maybe it was a guard unit. In any event, they were, because you know that. You got your regular military sent over there, and you got your reserves, and you got your guard units, and they're sent over there. And he wanted to see how the guard units were doing. And so he made arrangements through the, through the Defense Department to go visit, not just Saigon to the capital city to see all the politicians and so forth. He wanted to go onto the front line where the Idaho unit was stationed. And in retrospect, there weren't too many congressmen that would want to do that, and in retrospect, this, uh, the, 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 the Defense Department wouldn't give too much permission to congressmen who wanted to go to the front lines. But he managed to get it, and he went to the front line. And uh, the commander who was like in charge of that Idaho unit, he was really nervous. And he was like, you know, I do not want a congressman to be easily seen by some Viet Cong sniper who looks at the congressman's tag and so forth. And so he was like really, really nervous during that time period. And in fact, that night, when my dad was in that front line, you know, station and so forth, they came under fire. And the commander was like, get under the, get under the bed or the, the hammock or whatever it was. So my dad was under the hammock and so forth in there. As, as they were actually going up to the front line unit, I mean, my dad was like, well, I, I, I need to help out some way. So in the Jeep, he was like manning the gun in case, you know, they came under attack and so forth. You know, and he was, you know, he was in the Air Force Reserves and so forth, but he was a United States congressman. Later... 
when my dad, and nothing happened. He survived and so forth. Everything was fine. But later, when he came back to Idaho, he ran into some of those servicemen, and they were like, oh, man, that commander. He was like so nervous that you were going to get killed, and then the paperwork would have been like through the roof. Yeah, the paperwork, exactly. You know. So needless to say, not too many U.S. politicians going out to the front lines and so forth. It was dangerous, yeah. Yeah, I think they pretty much, I think they covered it up or somehow, like the whole little congressman tag and so forth. Yeah, I mean, they didn't want, yeah. I mean, he would have presented a, a great target for, for those guys. So here's what's going on. And actually, my dad's got some stories about this part. Write this down. The anti-war movement in the United States of America. That is a big, big factor. As the war goes on, more and more people in the United States are listening to this, oh, light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, we got all these dead Viet North Vietnamese troops. Oh, it, we're going to get it done at, like, you know, any time. They listen to all this. They look at the bigger numbers of soldiers that are going over there, and they're like not convinced that they're hearing accurate information from the government. And so you get more and more people joining the anti-war movement. So we get a crisis in our country. Because initially, you're like, everyone's like, hey, you know, Kennedy says we're going to help, you know, fight the enemy where they are and so forth. But by 1968, that's a really pivotal year, 1968, there's a lot of anti-war movement in the country. And there's other people supporting them. But it's critical because, did we have an all-volunteer military back then? No. And as President uh, Johnson is sending over hundreds of thousands of more soldiers, where are we getting those soldiers from? The draft. Write that down. The draft. The last military conflict the United States was involved in was during that time period. Uh, excuse me. The last time we had a draft that provided soldiers and so forth for the military conflict was during that time period. So there were exemptions. Guess what some of the exemptions were to you're going to get drafted and potentially sent over to fight in Vietnam? College. If you were in college, you were not draft eligible. Now, guess what level of society uh, e economically in the United States of America is not attending college in large numbers? Do you have any idea? Hmm? What? Poor or rich? Economic level. Huh? Are rich kids going to college? Are poor kids going to college? Where are they going? To war. What about the, um, like the racial composition of the United States military going over there? There's going to be a lot of African Americans larger than their percentage of the overall population in the United States of America. Write this down. Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders, in addition, it's continuing talking about civil rights issues, they're going to come out against the war because they're very concerned that the people who are doing a lot of the fighting and dying are poor people, African Americans and so forth, drafted to go fight. Forrest Gump? Uh, in the movie, I mean, the whole movie has got all these weird things and so forth. I think he volunteered. Oh, I know what it was, because he finished up college at the University of Alabama, right, where he'd run, Forrest, run. And then they're like, what are you going to do now? And then the recruiter comes and recruits him. I think he volunteered. My father-in-law volunteered. I mean, he joined the United States Marine Corps out of college, right? And so he was fighting in the early stages of the Vietnam War and some of the middle and late stages as well. He went over and did several tours of duty, right? So the thing that is going to really go bad for the United States um, support for the v Vietnam War effort, write this down. The Tet Offensive in early 1968. Write it down. The Tet Offensive. Let me explain about the Tet Offensive, OK? Tet meaning uh, Vietnamese New Year, OK? It's on the calendar. It occurs in January, so it's not January 1st, but it occurs later. Um, and, um, you know, that's when it's like, like, can we just, like, take a break on holidays? And it's like, there's an expectation that, like, you know, people are making, getting things ready in Saigon. There's all kinds of flowers and so forth going up all over the place, and people are bringing in flowers. Well, here's the thing. The Tet Offensive, write this down, is a massive military effort by the North Vietnamese military and the Viet Cong, they are throwing everything into the mix. And they are going to be attacking. It's a surprise attack, right? Because 
You know, the South Vietnamese are like, hey, come on, it's a holiday, give us a break. No, perfect day to launch an attack. So say the North Vietnamese. And the Americans actually got wind that it was going to take place. Perhaps we should have publicized it a little bit more. Nevertheless, where do you suppose the Tet Offensive is going to take place? North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces attacking South Vietnamese installations and U.S. military installations. Um, where do you suppose it's going to take place? In Not in America, no. <laughs> the entire South Vietnamese country. Write it down. They're popping out of all over the place. There's fighting going on all over the place. They actually had uh, Viet Cong, I believe they were, that got into the United States Embassy in Saigon, the capital city. I mean, it took quite a bit of work to get those guys killed, but we did. We got them all killed. There were attacks on U.S. bases throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the region. And there were some bloody, bloody attacks. And two things. One, the United States and South Vietnam won. We pushed back the Tet Offensive. Got that? The idea behind the Tet Offensive from the North Vietnamese was if they attack in such large numbers, eventually they can turn the tide of the war and just have a decisive victory. It didn't work out that way for them. They did not have massive victories all over. They were beaten back. And so the United States and South Vietnam could say, arguably, that was a big victory. But I want you to write this down too. You ready? The American public didn't see it that way. What the American public saw on television, because there were news correspondents from the television stations there filming and reporting back on nightly television, because people would watch their nightly television every night to see what was going on. And what they saw during the Tet Offensive was chaos, carnage, blood fire all over the place. And Americans were thinking, this doesn't fit the script that we've been hearing that there's light at the end of the tunnel that the war is almost won, that we just need a little bit more time. What the Americans were seeing on television was, this is a real war going on here. And it doesn't look like it's just about over. It looks like the enemy has been pretty active. Put this down. The anti-war uh, anti movement gained impetus as a result of the Tet Offensive. It's ironic because as a military effort by North Vietnam, it was a failure. But as a psychological effort to show that there was chaos and that the war was going to go on much, much longer, it had big impact in the United States. So it was successful because here, politically, in 1968, write this down, in 1968, Democrats began running for president against the Democratic president, Lyndon Johnson, saying, if we're elected, we're going to pull out of Vietnam. There was a couple of them. Eugene McCarthy did pretty well. And Robert F. Kennedy. Whoa! Robert F. Kennedy, like the brother of John F. Kennedy, the one who had been attorney general under Kennedy and then for a while under uh, Johnson, that really kind of stung Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. McNamara quit. He's out. New Secretary of Defense, Clark Clifford. He's going to take over. Clark Clifford, you see his name there? He's going to, it's Clark Clifford, and you'll hear him. What's that? 60, uh, I want to say 68, yeah. Johnson is just like astounded by events because he doesn't do that well in some of the, the early Democratic primaries. He's looking, he's like, man, I'm not, this is not going very well for me as president. And I'm, I might not get the nomination again, so he drops out of the race. Write that down. Lyndon Johnson drops out of the race. I mean, if you look and you sort of like do an epitaph of like Johnson's political career, the Vietnam War is not going to be listed as one of those big successes for him. In fact, it's going to be something that is identified as what helps bring him down. The remainder of his time in office, he is going to be pushing for negotiations with North Vietnam. Write that down. And these negotiations are going to continue on under the next president, under Nixon. And it's going to go on and on and on. And of course, the North Vietnamese are like, I don't know. We're actually in a pretty good position here. There's a lot of things we could get. It looks like our main adversary, the United States, wants to get out. 
What the heck? If you're in negotiations with somebody that wants to get out of the war, are you in a strong position? I'll just throw this out to you today. Who wants to get out of the war in Afghanistan? I'll give you two choices, the United States of America or the Taliban? Who wants to get out? Oh, the United States of America. Who wants to like uh, stay around in Afghanistan after the war is over? The Taliban. What would the Taliban like to be the conditions after the war is over? For them in charge, <laughs> yeah. So the government that we're actually supporting in Afghanistan is a little nervous about us pulling out militarily. And write this down. The government in South Vietnam is very nervous about the United States pulling out. Very nervous. Because they see if the United States pulls out because the public doesn't support U.S. military involvement there anymore, they might not be able to survive. Even if North Vietnam promises not to attack. And that's ultimately what's going to happen. Who's going to cut the deal with North Vietnam to pull American troops out? Nixon. Richard Nixon. Okay. Richard Nixon, write this down. He ends up being the Republican nominee for president in 1968. It's his political comeback because he ran for president in 1960 after having served as vice president for eight years, and he got beat by Kennedy. And then he ran for governor of California like two years later and got beat. And then made a political comeback in 1968. He made a political comeback, and he was elected president. Write this down. What was his policy on Vietnam? He wanted to hand over responsibility for fighting to South Vietnam. He wanted to, bit by bit by bit, pull the troops out. Although Richard Nixon's very interesting, because he knew how negotiations worked. As he was negotiating with the, the North Vietnamese and so forth, we did intensive bombing, intensive bombing, not against Soviet troops <laughs> or ships. We don't want to have World War III, but take a look here. During Nixon's presidency, and we'll, we'll pick up on this theme again as we talk later about the end of the uh, uh, Vietnam War, the whole range of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, even in neutral Cambodia, and Nixon kept it kind of a secret that we were actually bombing in neutral Cambodia. And we were bombing the enemy in neutral Cambodia, but nevertheless, it was still a neutral country. Boom, boom, boom. Nixon is going to have lots of bombing. And what is going to happen on the campuses of the United States of America? Anti-war protests. My dad, I remember, as a congressman, went to uh, Idaho State University for a visit. And there were anti-war protests going on. Have you guys ever been to Pocatello to visit Idaho State University? It's normally fairly pretty calm. But in the early 1970s, like many campuses, there was a lot of protesting going on and so forth there. I mean, it was, yeah, it was pretty clear. At least among many young people, they were like, let's get this whole war over. I mean, Kent State, they had protests at Kent State. Who knows about Kent State? I mean, like, what bad things could happen at Kent State? We'll see this. We'll save this for the next thing. Yeah, there are four dead in Ohio in Kent State because there were some protests there. And to provide security, the National Guard was called out. Okay, well, fine. The National Guard gets called out. And they're issued live ammunition. Oh, dear. And if you issue guys with live ammunition, you see massive groups of people protesting and so forth, and they're, like, shouting at you and sometimes throwing things at you and so forth, don't be surprised if mm, ah, pff, they fire off their weapons and injure a whole bunch of people and kill four people. So... Write this down. The war is not over at the end of 1968. The war will continue in Vietnam for several more years, and the president in charge of U.S. policy is going to be Richard Nixon. And will he ultimately cut a deal with the North Vietnamese? Yes. Will the South Vietnamese be happy about it? No, because we're going to pull our troops out with a promise that if the North ever attacks, we'll be back. We'll save your bacon. And that's going to take place during the time of President Ford. And they will attack. And President Ford's like, I'm going back. And the rest of the country, at least Congress, says, mm, no, mm, mm. Sorry, South Vietnam. We'll look at how that plays out ultimately. OK? Any questions on this so far? OK? I've got that video, the CNN video, as what you need to be watching um, in time for the next class. 
I'm going to go ahead and get us started on the next topic, which is MAD. MAD brings sanity. Write that down. MAD brings sanity. How is it possible for an acronym that looks like insanity to bring a level of sanity? What are we, what are we even talking about here? Write this down. This is going to be, this is actually in episode 12. We're going to start giving you the notes on that one because it's pretty straightforward. Mutual assured destruction. If we go to war and I hit you first, you have the ability to still hit back and destroy me. So maybe I shouldn't hit you first. Or maybe you shouldn't hit me first because I have the ability to fight back and destroy you. Do you want a technical definition? Here we go. Write this down. The Cold War, thankfully, ultimately, had a security, had a stability about it. It's really weird. I would say that in the world since the Cold War, since 1991 and the Cold War was officially over, Soviet Union is done, it's a little bit more unnerving. I mean, I suppose in one sense, like, I don't know, the United States and China, do you think we're going to have the United States and China go to a full-on war in your lifetime? Possibly, maybe. Like, if we went to war with China, what would they bring? Pew, pew, big boom. What would we bring? Boom, boom, big boom. <laughs> I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, you guys are just so complex. <laughs> I hope it doesn't happen. You know, it's not like, is, is there things that the United States is like, stay away from that, and China's like, we want that Taiwan. I mean, I've been reading things about, like, oh, what could happen? You know, does China want to get Taiwan? Yes, they do. Has the United States ever said, you know, stay away from Taiwan? Yeah, we have said that. But could possibly the United States ever be in a position that we appear so weak that we're not willing to really, like, back up Taiwan? That we would be willing to go to war? How many of you guys are like, I'm willing to go to war, nuclear war, to protect Taiwan from being overtaken from the People's Republic of China? What could they what? Here's what we say we will do, and we said, write this down, to our friends and our allies throughout the Cold War, here's what we said we will do. To the Soviet Union, Communist China, don't cross that line or it's nuclear. And the Soviets kind of did the same thing. What was, we already talked about in this unit, what was an area that the Soviets like, those are our friends? Exactly. You don't cross that line, United States of America. You lost Cuba. Cuba's now Castro. He's our buddy, said the Soviet Union. We would say during the Cold War the same thing about Taiwan. Do we still say that today? Do we say that about our NATO allies, France? Germany, Estonia, that we got your back and we'll go nuke. This is why it's weird, because in the Cold War, there's, certain, there's a certain stability. We're not dealing with rogue terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, things like that. We're dealing with countries that we have in our sights, and they've got us in their sights. And so it's kind of like everyone knows. That's why the Vietnam War is so frustrating, because it's like, we got the battlefield going on in Vietnam, but both sides have an understanding that we're not going to take it outside of that, because if we do, people are dead. The world is dead. The United States is dead. The Soviet Union is dead. And it all has to do with this uh, concept. Ready? Mutual assured destruction, also known as deterrence. We have deterrence. The Soviets have deterrence. In our nuclear military forces, write it down, our nuclear military forces, the official definition is if the other side hits you with a first strike, you still have the ability to kill between 20 to 50 percent of their population. Do you understand that? So even if they got a first strike, we could take out upwards of 50 percent. We have enough forces that are safe and reserved, nuclear forces, that even if we got hit hard, we could still retaliate. And they could too. So therefore, don't do it. 
That's what gives you the sanity. Don't do it. Don't step over the line. What's usually the trigger point? If the United States forces and Soviet forces are in direct conflict. That's why we didn't attack the Soviet ships going to North Vietnam. That's why the Soviets are going to avoid attacking our forces in places like West Berlin and other parts of the world. You want to have that mutual assured destruction. So there's a lot of technical details that are going to be associated with this concept. And you're going to need to write those down. If you look in your handout, this would be all on the top of page three. Okay? On the top of page three. Um, one of the things that we've, and we've already talked about this somewhat. I mean, which country developed the first bomb? Nuclear bomb. We did. Did the Soviets develop one? Yeah. Who developed the first hydrogen bomb? Really, really big one. We did. Did the Soviets develop one? Yep. Who developed the first uh, ability to launch a missile over to the other side? Soviets did. Did we catch up? Yes, we did. Okay. Um, so these are going to be some of the things. Both sides will be developing the capability of launching nuclear weapons at each other and also trying to figure out how to detect. Write this down. July 1960, uh, we had, among our regular missions, flying over. Eventually, we'll have satellites taking care of these sorts of things to a degree. Uh, we had some flyovers into Soviet territory. They were detected by Soviet radar, and the Soviets sent up their jets, their MiG fighters, and took down our planes that were, our plane that was um, inspecting what was going on. We flew into their space. Some of our, four of our, uh, our servicemen were dead. The other two stuck in prison, in Soviet prison. So it was a bit of a danger to be conducting spy flights over the Soviet Union. Other key developments. The Titan missile, write that one down. The Titan missile um, is a very important development in our ability to launch intercontinental ballistic missiles. And this is going to be one of those things that we're going to be continually working on in the 1950s and the 60s. Better, more reliable missiles that can go long distances. Although there's a scientific aspect to those missiles too. Because if you can get a Titan rocket that can launch something a long way. Maybe you can put men on the top of it. Now, you're not going to be like, we're going to launch men in a nuclear missile <laughs> to the Soviet Union. No, 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 no. Why would you put men on the top of some big, massive rocket? Outer space. To the moon, exactly. We're going to, John F. Kennedy said it is our goal in uh, his administration that before the century, excuse me, before the decade was over, we would have a man on the moon. Did, did we achieve that? When did the United States land man on the moon? 1969, yeah, during President Nixon's administration. So Kennedy got the program started. It kept going on during Johnson. But there's like military overlaps with those various different technologies, okay? So Kennedy is looking to increase our ability to have missiles. The Soviets are increasing their ability to have missiles. They actually, October 30th, 1960, October 30th, 1960, the Soviets developed their biggest bomb ever. They tested a bomb that exploded at a level of 50 million tons of TNT. Just to give you a sense of how big that explosion was, that was more than all of the explosive devices used in World War II. That's what the, that's what the uh, video said. I wrote that down when, from the video. Yeah, I mean, it's like the later nukes are bigger and more powerful than the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What's that? Um, more toxic over a larger area. Yeah, so in that sense, more toxic. I think, you know, per square inch, maybe not more toxic, but over a vast area, yes, because it creates more nuclear material. And, of course, yeah, I mean, very, very bad. Um, one of the things that we got mad at them for was they weren't supposed to be testing. They had agreed on a moratorium of nuclear testing. So what does the United States do in response to that? If the Soviets are going to start testing more nuclear weapons, what are we going to do? Boom, we're going to test them. And where are we going to do it? 
Where do we do it? Where do we do, where, where do, we do our nuclear testing? I mean, the Soviets do it way the heck out in, you know, where a lot of, not a lot of people live. And there's plenty of area in the Soviet Union like that. And now oceans, we did do some testing, like the Bikini Islands and so forth. But most of our testing kind of from that point on is going to take place just south of Idaho, Nevada. Write it down, Nevada. So in the earth, that's scary. I already told you that last time, right? Well, here's the thing. Don't, don't worry about the explosion in Nevada. Just worry about all the nuclear fissile material that goes up into the atmosphere and gets caught into the winds, prevailing winds, and gets dropped. What are some, one of the, some of the locations? Huh? <laughs> well, there was. There was an increase. There was. Idaho is part of the downwind area. I showed you that, that, that thing before. You remember that? So, like, I mean, I've got, like, yeah, it's like my older cousins, because I was born in 63. There was a, oh, here we go. Uh, 1963, limited test ban treaty. Do you see that? The United States and the Soviets agree, no more atmospheric tests. So do we still test? Yeah, underground. You can still blow something up underground, then you look at a crater and go, whoa, well, uh, there it is. But if you have it above ground, then you get all that fallout. You understand? I was born in August 63. Some of my older cousins in Idaho and so forth, some have had like thyroid issues and other people had thyroid issues. Because you get too much radiation and so forth, it lands on the grass, and the cows eat the grass, and you eat the cows, and you drink the milk, and da 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 It's a problem. So there have been some um, United States government programs to uh, provide compensation for people who may have conducted, uh, uh, contracted um, some disease from radiation. <sighs> All in the name of national security. At the time that a lot of these things were done, I mean, if you look over historically and go, I don't know, it looks pretty good. I mean, it's good for jobs. And then you have ultimately like, why are there birds not singing anymore? Because they're dead. Too much, like, really highly toxic pesticides, things like that. We learn over time. You can conduct nuclear experiments and think, oh, well, the boom is gone. Yes, but the radiation is something you need to be aware of thereafter. Mm. Yes? Oh, yeah, they said it in the ground. Yeah, most of the tests and so forth is not like the, I mean, the, the flyover drop, that's like to test and see if like your dropping mechanism and so forth works. You don't need to have the plane going over. You could actually just have something that sort of like drops yeah. down and then, you know, to make sure that it like is triggered properly. Yes? Mm -mm. Was that in this country? Wow. Um, wow. No, I have not heard about that. It's still in orbit, huh? Yeah. Okay. Watch out. Duck, you know, if you're in outer space. Watch out for the manhole cover. Okay? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. So here we go. Um, there, was a, there was a proposed plan. I think the Soviets came up with this plan. Write this down. It's called the No Cities Plan, that maybe both sides would agree to exempt cities from the attack of the other. That's not going to be a winner. Why, why would you be I mean, yeah, it's sort of like, oh, well, we don't want to have nuclear war that's going to kill people. If you have nuclear war, it's going to kill people. Just own up to it, you know? Own up to it. This is where, I mean, keep an eye on this issue, because eventually when we get to, like, President Reagan in our next unit, he's going to say, I want to come up with a technology that would prevent any missiles landing in the United States of America. Sounds like fun. I mean, he says that's the moral thing to do, prevent anything from attacking you and hitting you. Of course, then if you're the Soviets, you're like, wow, if the United States can develop that and it goes into effect next month, what should I do with my missiles this month? Use them. <laughs> and use them or lose the ability to use them effectively against your enemies. So next time we will talk more about uh, this whole continue on this whole nuclear warfare issue and the disarmament issues and submarine launched missiles and so forth okay yes we're done with the vietnam war up to 19 the end of 1968. when we get to episode number 16 it's going to come back in again and i hinted at some of those issues I'm following the way it's organizationally structured in the film, so, you know, it works out fine. We'll be, we'll continue episode number 12, MAD, 
We'll get into episode 14, Red Spring, to look at what's going on with the Soviets in East Europe in the early 1960s, and then we'll come back to the Vietnam War in a larger context under Nixon in the episode called Detente. There's some good stuff coming up here. But wipe down your desks, get to class on time, and yeah, and I remember, I'm gonna turn it off.